Well, hello and welcome. Uh, this is Armando Roggio, host of Commerce Co. And if you are here with me live, thank you very much. If you're watching this in the replay, thank you very much. I hope you enjoy it. I have just been in the green room chatting with uh, Brian Rainey, who is our presenter today. And I just want to make this clear for everyone in the audience, and especially Cap, Brian is particularly articulate. Brian, thank you for uh, being here with us on this recording today. I very much appreciate it. Thanks, Armando. Happy to be here. And in fact, what I'm going to do for just a second here, uh, you'll have to reshare your screen, but I want to make you full screen for just a second before you get started. Okay. So uh, so there we are, full screen, so everybody can get a good look at us. Um, I'm the old guy with the beard. Brian is the younger, handsome guy with the beard uh, and the and the baseball fan. See, I'm all these compliments. I was going to say, we are, Armando, we are recording here, right? Because I'm going to... Fantastic. That, Thank you. That's it. You know, and I'll... Uh, I'll make an edit of this for you specifically. <laughs> <laughs> well, and thank you. I got up both handsome. So thank you. I appreciate thank you very that. very much. Um, with, with that, Brian, I'm sorry if I messed up your two screen relationship. Nope, not, a wanna, not a problem. Not a problem. I want to go ahead I, and, uh, I, and I, reshare. Uh, I can figure out the technology from that standpoint, I think. Awesome. So uh, without too much further ado, you're going to be talking to us, obviously, about uh, print on demand. Everyone who is watching live, please go ahead and chat in questions as you have them, and we'll save those for the end of the presentation. Uh, and uh, if you want to, we'll be happy to bring you on screen as you ask and we answer those. If not, I'll just ask them of Brian. Brian, with that, please uh, get started when you're ready. Thanks so much, Amanda. That is that is truly the best introduction. Uh, I'm going to clip that and just use that going forward. Um, so uh, Brian Rainey, I'm the CEO of Guten. We are a on-demand manufacturing company. Uh, we are a software platform that enables tech enablement into on-demand manufacturing broadly. Um, I'm gonna really talk today around the idea of the industry itself uh, and focus on that. I'm gonna utilize Guten's capabilities and, and why we have, have set up our company the way we have, but I think it's incredibly applicable to the broader industry that's gonna be helpful. Um, for those of you watching live and some of you kind of looking at this, you know, I came into manufacturing on demand accidentally, as my team likes to point out. I started as a mailman, uh, which is always where we start my career, although technically that is in the logistics space. So it's uh, it, it, that does work. Um, but I didn't at the time in 2015, and we'll get into the company, I didn't understand what manufacturing on demand necessarily was, but I absolutely understand where it could go. And uh, Armando, this this entire conversation came about uh, after we talked uh, last week or two weeks ago, and you came into that conversation very, very skeptical. You, uh, you know, you thought manufacture on demand and print on demand was Cafe Press from 2005. And over our conversation, you know, we really talked about what those differences are. That's what we're going to focus on today, um, and that's where we're going to go. Um, so. A little bit about Guten. Uh, we were founded in 2015. We operate a smart supply chain for online brands, merchants, content creators that, that allows them to run their e-commerce business and focus on what makes them best. We provide the software layer that provides access to best in class manufacturing capacity, both domestically here in the United States and, and, and globally throughout the world. We'll, we'll show a map of, of our manufacturing facilities. Uh, one of the things I really do want to focus on and that I'm going to keep harping on is this concept of specialization. One of the ideas of the Guten platform is allowing merchants to focus on what they're good on, creating an audience, connecting with their audience, selling to their audience, and allowing specialists to produce products, produce technology, to optimize those sort of situations on the back end. There's a number of companies that are doing this. I recommend as you look into the manufacturer on demand business, there's a number of different companies will talk through those differences, really find the right fit for you that's gonna be uh, really, really helpful. Um, why Guten? I might as well just get this out of the way. I know we're gonna have people watching this afterwards. Um, you know, Guten is an homage to Johannes Gutenberg. Johannes Gutenberg, in my opinion, I'm a, I'm a big reader, I think, uh, changed the world almost more than any other human being uh, in history by uh, inventing the printing press. Guten, Johannes Gutenberg democratized knowledge via the uh, sort of extension of books and learning and, and, and led almost directly. There's almost a straight line between Johannes Gutenberg and the end of the Dark Ages. We are Guten to democratize the availability of on-demand manufacturing. While that may be grandiose to compare us to what I think the single most important human in, in, in all of history is, um, 
we have been told to think big. So, you know, that's what we're going with. So when you think about most important human in history, if you want to equate us as the most important company in history, I will not, uh, I, I, I will not uh, uh, hold you back from that. So it, as we talked about and as I opened with in talking to Armando, let's talk about why manufacturing is so complex. Why is on-demand manufacturing even something we're talking about? I think we have to compare that to where things are at today and where they've come historically, right? Bulk manufacturing has its absolute applications. Obviously, it's been that way for almost 100 years. The fashion industry, the home decor industry, uh, the wall art industry, obviously photography to a certain extent has extended into on-demand only because of the, per the personal nature of, of, of photographs. But when you look at traditional manufacturing, there's an enormous amount of complexity that is involved in that. And in the way that Shopify has effectively democratized the availability to set up an e-commerce storefront, that's really what we're looking to do is to create that access point. So the story that we're gonna be talking through is cost and focus. When you think about warehousing, warehousing adds cost. That adds a, a shipping cost, that adds a holding cost, that holds an overhead cost. And so there is a there is an incremental cost to warehousing, not just in running the warehouse, but in underlying in, in sort of operating that warehousing cost inventory and the need to keep inventory increases working capital needs. That idea that you have to pre purchase something to be able to sell it later is one a mismatch in how much you can sell versus how much you need to purchase as a, as a merchant. But there's also a fundamental underlying working capital need where now you've paid money out before you've gotten that money in. That lack of support, that lack of support that's needed is gonna increase the size of your company. You need to have somebody that's interacting with your warehousing operations. You need to have somebody that's interacting with your end customers. You have to have somebody that's making sure that you have enough inventory on hand, that you're tracking how much you have. And that underlying upfront commitment, as, we, as I sort of talked about, not only do you have to pay in advance, but you have to estimate on your design, on your product, on your, on your connection with your customer base, how many of them are going to be incentivized to buy that item? You have to guess that up front. And if you get that wrong, it becomes incredibly expensive. And what's interesting about it is if you get it wrong on the low side, it's almost just as bad as if you get it wrong on the upside. Because if you sell out of an incredibly popular item, you're losing that connection with your customer. And that, that, that need to be connected to your customer is incredibly important. Finally, it's an incredibly manual process. Typically, there is not one platform as you think about ingesting customer orders, processing them, making sure they get shipped out, feeding that information back to your customer. In, in a lot of ways, Amazon is the gold standard for e-commerce simply because they have set the underlying expectations to the end customer. And so the end customer never needs to interact with somebody on Amazon. Are you putting that same information in front of your customer that they expect? With that, let's launch into really talk and think about print on demand, right? And I wanna start with sustainable because one of the easiest, fastest, and, and, and frankly, most uh, surprising stats that, that when I talk about manufacture on demand and print on demand, especially as it, as, as it applies to some of our core business areas, the rate of overproduction in the fashion industry is estimated at 30 to 40% every single season. Every single season, 30% more units are created than are sold. That's happening every spring, every summer, every fall, and every winter. The fashion industry is a $2.5 trillion industry that is responsible for 10% of humanity's carbon emissions. Fashion is responsible for the, is the second highest emitter of carbon in the world. And so while we talk about energy and clean cars and all of this, you never, you rarely hear about the impact that fashion has. And this idea of, cons of consumption-based fashion is driving a huge amount of carbon emissions. So that idea of sustainability, just to start, we're not talking about cost improvements. We're not talking about optimizations and working capital. We're talking literally just about sustainability. On-demand manufacturing can absolutely improve the life of everybody. Um, and so now let's think about the kind of risk matching and that opportunity, right, to say, again, instead of buying something before you sell it, on-demand manufacturing allows you to buy that item after you've sold it. There's an immediate match between the exact amount of inventory you have versus those products that your customers want. And one thing that we talk about with people all the time, if you sell 500 units, let's talk about 500 t-shirts, 
and you produce 100 smalls, 100 mediums, 100 larges, 100 extra larges, and 100 two extra, uh, double extra larges, well, you can sell out of your mediums and your larges and somehow still have not served all of your customers because you're sold out of medium and large and be over capacity on small, extra small and large. So there's a real match not only to the exact product and the exact specification, but also to sort of how your production capacity can move. I think one of the notes that we talk about as a subset within on-demand manufacturing is not just a modification of legacy production methods, it's actually the ability to customize that underlying item. I've already talked about photography. By definition, photography is effectively customized with every photo. It's different with every photo. But when you offer, if you give your customer or you give your user base the ability to customize that underlying item, to feel more attached to that item, you can actually increase the average selling price by 20%, which is straight profit to the bottom line. With mass customization, because each imprint is done uniquely, you're charging slightly more for customization, which is something the customers want, but you're not actually taking any incremental cost for that. Finally, the streamlined process. The idea that you are, you are skipping inventory, you're skipping warehousing, you're skipping those items. When an item is purchased, there is a straight line from production to fulfillment, to logistics, to customer. And that idea that that item never hits a way station really encapsulates this idea that there is a significantly more streamlined process here. Now, let's talk about the issues within the on-demand industry. I talked about Armando coming in and, and, and asking me about Cafe Press in 2005. You know, there is a very real difference within the industry from an output standpoint. And I've shown two wide sort of ranges here. On the left is a four color print head DTG apparel printer, right? Now this looks a lot like a home printer. The output is an on-demand manufactured piece of apparel, okay? So when you are buying that item, they're selling you the output that sounds completely similar to the unit on the right. The unit on the right is a $600,000 machine. It can process 120 impressions an hour. It can run retail color gamut because it has a six color print head versus a four color print head. It can utilize, it can create uh, impressions in 20 seconds where the unit on the, on, the, on the left will take you two minutes. And so think about the fixed asset capacity here. I can process almost six times more the volume in a Cornet Atlas than I can from a standard off the shelf DTG printer. But again, as a merchant partner, I'm still selling you this concept of the same outlying item. It is incredibly important that within an industry by which growth is based on the hardware improvements, that growth is increasing because of what the hardware can do, that you are focused on matching the underlying production method to the quality of what you're doing. And I think to, to expand that out a bit, we wanna talk about this concept of enterprise grade. We wanna talk about this concept of roll to roll printers, that these are massive factories. The average size of a Guten manufacturing center is around 250,000 square feet. And if you think back, that's, a, that's 16 units of each underlying production method that we have to create capacity and redundancy. One of the biggest things that I talked about initially, under production can be just as bad as over production, right? The idea of under promising and over delivering flips very quickly if a sale absolutely rockets and you don't have the capability to, to fulfill that. Now you've created a situation by which your customers are now unhappy because they put an order. I think as consumers, we all experienced that April, May, and June of 2020 when logistics broke down. This absolutely happened with fixed asset capacity. One of the things that you really need to understand is if things go well for my business, do I have the manufacturing partner that can keep up with that, right? Act as if, if your business succeeds, you need to make sure that it succeeds. If it fails, then what does it matter, right? So you might as well ask whether or not if I hit 5,000 units in a month, when I'm starting out with 10, when I'm starting out with 20, when I'm starting out with 50, can you handle 5,000 as easily as you can handle 50? That becomes incredibly important. We're gonna move into who uses Guten. And again, I'm gonna really focus on, on the Guten platform, or I'm gonna to try to talk about it in terms of the industry. So we can think about the on-demand business in a couple of different ways. You can think about it from a product basis. So home decor, fashion, photography, we've talked about, uh, wall art, textiles, 
uh, additional products, mugs, porcelain ornaments, seasonal items. These are all capable. Really, the idea of what you're looking for and the definition when we talk about on-demand manufacturing is, can you produce an item within a 72-hour average time period at a minimum order quantity of one? That's When we talk about on-demand manufacturing, that's how we're going to scope it. There's different ways to think about it. That's one of the best ways. One of the other ways to think about it is the vertical. Are you in the entertainment business? Are you in the gifts business? Are you in the personalization business? Are you in the e-commerce platform business? Are you enabling e-commerce? These are other ways to think about it. One thing that I really do want to stress here, if you're thinking about taking on on-demand manufacturing, think about it in a complementary way where the underlying value of what you're selling is the content, not the item. You are monetizing the content. Can on-demand manufacturing either replace a legacy production method? Can it optimize your existing pr production methods? Or in a lot of ways, can you extend the value of the underlying content by enabling more products without having to take on that cost? It's a really good way to think about how to adopt on-demand manufacturing and start to apply it into your business. We talked about specialization earlier. I want to hit on that again. What is important for merchant partners who think about the adoption? Are you owning and controlling the design? Are you owning and controlling the content? Are you publishing that? Are you really connecting with your audience? E-commerce is a very, very simple formula. Traffic times conversion rate times average cart value equals your profits within e-commerce equals your revenues within e-commerce. And so when we think about specialization, the more time you're spending on things that are not traffic, conversion rate, and average cart value, you are by definition not spending your time on those things that increase your revenue, that increase your ability to connect with your audience. And so when we think then of what Guten handles and what on-demand manufacturing can do, depending on the partner that you, that you select, is to produce that item, to fill that item, and ship that item. Ensure that item gets to the end customer. Now, one of the things that we're also going to talk about, and I'll start going into kind of different layers here, is post-order support. How can you make sure that the customer that you have spent money to acquire, right, whether that's through content, whether that's through marketing, whether that's through advertising, cost of cost to acquire means that you need to have <clears throat> a customer connection. Is your manufacturing on demand partner matching or exceeding the way your brand looks? There are economy brands, right, where the lowest cost wins, but increasingly that underlying content has to match, the value of the brand has to match the physical product. Really, really make sure that, that, that you're focusing on that and asking those questions. What questions should you be asking? Funny, that's my next slide. So when we think about the Guten approach, we call this the Guten 7, and I think we can normalize this to really think about when you're partnering with an on-demand manufacturing partner, what should you be asking for? Are you, from an account management approach, do you have someone that's assigned to your business that can help you apply the different opportunities within on-demand manufacturing to your business? As I said, on-demand manufacturing can be a replacement, it can be a substitution, or it can be a complementary business, and there's different ways to utilize that. Our account management approach allows our account managers to apply the Guten network and broadly the on-demand universe to your business. When you think about tailored sourcing, as I talked about, as you grow, as you find that niche, as you find that ability to connect with your customer, is your partner able to grow with you? Are they able to localize your services? Are they able to increase the capacity on your behalf? Are they able to move into adjacent product areas? When we talk about specialization, that's true in the on-demand manufacturing world as well. Best-in-class apparel manufacturers do not also produce best-in-class wall art, do not also produce best-in-class home decor. That's three different integrations. If you're going best-in-class to match that, how are you managing that? How are you managing that underlying expansion? I talked about that idea of the more time that you spend that is not directly related to traffic, average cart value and conversion rate, the less time you're spending on pushing your business forward, do you have the ability to seamlessly ingest orders and then seamlessly pass those orders to your order management partner? So when you think about that, if a customer places an order, is there a manual intervention where you're ingesting that order and then passing it over? 
Is there a manual ingestion point for your manufacturing partner where they have to process that order? Adding time within the order processing uh, uh, order flow increases the time by which your customer gets that item. And time increasingly is a differentiating topic here when we think about an average production time of 24, 36, or 48 hours. When you think about launching your business, are you ready to go day one? Are you testing a product out? Is this your core business model? Or are you extending your business model? These are questions you need to ask day one and make sure that your manufacturing partner aligns with that. Is this something that you're testing the market to get market validation on? That's a very different partner than replacing and literally ripping out and replacing your entire production method. Finally, efficient operations, financial support and merchant support. What level of support are you getting? I wanna give one stat that's broadly true that's probably actually increased over the past year. 1% of shipments are going to get lost. They are going to get misdirected. I don't care if you use USPS or UPS or FedEx. I do care if you use DHL, but you know you are going to have one percent of your orders get lost. That's just going to happen. The problem is for that one customer, one hundred percent of their orders got lost. Are you equipped, and do you have the team and the support to be able to handle that? Because that is the restart of the process. That item needs because we're producing on demand. That item needs to be reproduced. That item needs to be reshipped. And so do you have the capabilities? Do you have the partner that you're working with so that when situations arise, which they do, you can very quickly respond to those so that you turn a negative situation for your customer into a positive situation? I want to give that example from a time standpoint of what this looks like in going manufacturer direct. Again, there are absolute applications in which going direct to a manufacturer or having a single sourcing and fulfillment center does make sense. But in an increasingly connected world, if you're shipping in even just the domestic United States, there are eight shipping zones. And so if you're partnering with a manufacturing facility in California, just to ship that item standard, it's going to take six days to get to New York. Now, if you produce that item in New Jersey, that same item will get there next day, same shipping method, because you've located, you've, you've, you've taken the concept of nearshoring and you've gotten it to entirely localization. And before you think, oh, I know how to figure this out, I'm just gonna put all of my manufacturing capacity in Kansas, guess what? The United States population has conspired against e-commerce sellers by perfectly positioning themselves so that California, New York, and Texas are your three major shipping zones. And if you ship from Kansas, California and New York are now both zone eight for you. So you really need a distributed network. We have seen more and more manufacturing partners start to co-locate and open up multiple shipping zones. But when you think about what the Guten network can do, what having a software layer on top of this, you can now create a network by which orders can be routed based on that end address to provide the same underlying product. When you look at the different colored products here, this is how we broadly bucket between apparel, home decor, wall art, extended products. So our ability to look at where that product is going and ultimately land a data packet rather than a package with a manufacturer buys that time where I could ingest an order two days after an order has been shipped out of California and I can produce ship and land it faster because I can produce that item in New Jersey. This has obviously also the added benefit of cutting down on shipping time. As you increase the distance, you increase the cost. So not only are you providing a better service to your end customer, you're also actually increasing the, the profit that you're taking as we think about shipping. When you're selling it to your customer, it is a product. Extending that out, and I, I say this a lot, commerce and content does not have borders. And so if you start to create a brand by which you can take, uh, take advantage of an international marketplace, do you have a solution that is global? This includes not only time, this includes not only production and shipping capacity. Now we're introducing the idea of customs, we're introducing the idea of trade barriers, we're introducing the idea of a custom agent getting your package and not having that. If you produce in country, you skip all of those items. You're effectively producing domestic goods for a domestic audience on a global basis. 
When we think about Guten's proprietary technology, what we really do focus on is this idea of a single API. We deliver microservices. Our platform is meant to be targeted to your business. That ability to take the best of the, the capabilities of Guten, whether that's product creation, product sourcing, order management, production management, shipping, logistics, even all the way to end customer support. We, with white label customer support and the ability to answer on behalf of our partners, providing detailed updates on orders that are working, orders that have been lost, orders that have issues. All of these things are in a singular view. But that view can be customized based on the individual business. I'll give an example. For the personalization and customization business, you wanna have that order captured, locked in, and, and, and that money collected before your personalization business goes in and customizes that item, creates that, that, that image, creates that printable file that includes the customization item, rather than putting that back to your customer to create a delay by which ultimately the conversion rate falls significantly because they effectively don't check out. Our system has the ability to hold an order until you customize it, even after we confirm that order to the end customer. Really think about that, that the application of the service services being provided to your business specifically, can you fit that? Do you have out-of-the-box integrations? If you're on Shopify, there's a number of opportunities. Etsy, similar. WooCommerce, less. BigCommerce, less. So really look at all of your stack. Is this best for your business? And really think about that as you think about your production source. Finally, that idea of a merchant dashboard. Once an item is sold, right? That's revenue in the bank, but you still have to deliver it. Do you have everything at your fingertips that you need to be able to respond to your customers? That's incredibly important. We work with at Guten a number of different partners. I've talked about the different areas that we are, but we have different individual applications from One Live Media, which is a retailing brand with 1,300 merchants underneath it, to Jackbox Games, which is apparently the savior for everyone in quarantine to play uh, games on their phone, uh, to direct uh, integrations with Local Llama and CJ Prince that, that are fulfilling directly from their storefront. Really think about, I, I, I say it over and over, and it's incredibly important. What is that applicability of your manufacturing partner, of your print-on-demand selection to your business itself? I've got a quote in here from Dale that really does focus on this idea. Easier to scale. Act as if, if you are an enterprise business, if you're looking to do this at an enterprise grade, then you would not go out and buy a beginner platform. And I actually make the exact opposite recommendation. If you're starting your business, then integrating with an enterprise grade, grade platform doesn't make the most sense for you. Do what makes the most sense to test, iterate, and figure it out and understand where in the market you fit. Be very honest with yourself because the more honest that you are and the better the fit, the better that partnership is over the long term. I want to land here really again with the why work with Guten. I'm going to almost repeat what I just talked about, about why we set it up, right? Outsourcing non-core uh, functions. That's one of the entire ideas here. No one is running cold server storage anymore because they can use Azure. They can use AWS. They can use fractional ownership. This is the same idea. On-demand manufacturing, if you're not in the manufacturing industry, is something that you should be outsourcing. You can control your costs. You can improve your margins. You can better align revenues and expenses. You're eliminating those operational concerns. Ask yourself, and I'm going to ask you on the next slide, do you have 11 people calling manufacturing centers every single day on behalf of your orders? If you don't, you might want to think about going out uh, outsourced. Technical overhead is incredibly important. Do you have a platform that can do everything that you need, or are you having to custom create that yourself? Are you getting consistently high quality? Do you have a single point of contact? Even if you're running three direct manufacturer relationships, you have three phone calls to make. You have to call each one of those when an order goes wrong. Do you have a single point of contact that is responsible for your account? And finally, that idea of dedicated solutions team, right? The other side of redundancy is capacity. Do you have the ability, does your partner have the ability to grow and scale with you? Is that business alignment there? Quick stats on Guten, we've grown 10X since 2017. We are riding a wave of a shift in the industry, no doubt. But again, I really wanna focus on these stats in a way that says, does this match what your business is doing? There are amazing platforms for solo entrepreneurs who are getting their business started, 
that are much simpler, that allow you to get a foot in the door. We are an enterprise grade platform so that when you figure that out, when you connect with your audience, when you have merchandising, you have the ability to scale with it. We call it grow with Guten for a reason. We wanna grow with your platform. Uh, some of the other stats here, 95% shipped on time, 70% of items produced within the United States and shipped to the United States at 1.7 production error rate. These are baseline metrics that you should be looking at and asking your provider, are you meeting or exceeding these items? These are the ones that are incredibly important. Our fully managed services include print on demand and shipping as I've talked to, but that technology integration is incredibly important. Sourcing creation and digital optimization, we've talked about a lot. What do you need for your business? The opportunity to have white label customer support and a unified single invoicing. Do not underestimate the difficulty if you're selling 5,000 units a week of how difficult that is to, to reconcile back to your, your selling platform. Are you matching your expenses with your revenues? That is a theme. The idea of customized solutions is here, right? For our enterprise customers, we absolutely come in and tailor our platform for you. That's a technology tailoring and also a product tailoring and a services tailoring. When you get into that enterprise level, this is what becomes incredibly important. You can do that in-house or you can outsource it. You can work with a partner. That's where Guten sits. With that, Armando, I think I hit my mark here uh, on 30 minutes. Um, I, uh, we've got our marketing at guten.com. Rest assured, that does not go to me. So you'll get a response, no question, as I fall behind on emails. Uh, but we'd love to hear from you. Happy to answer any questions that anybody has. And uh, I just put that Thank email you. address uh, in the uh, in the chat. Just for those who are unfamiliar, we're still with the Crowdcast uh, platform. When you come back as a member of Commerce Co and watch this, all of those uh, links and questions are still there. And uh, as we ask the questions, you'll be able to actually jump to any question that was uh, typed in and look at it. So <clears throat> the very first thing I want to start with, Brian, is actually a question of speed. Because a couple times you mentioned speed as part of this process. You know, can you produce an item uh, in 72 hours at a, a quantity of one? And then, you know, you also talked about 24, 36, 48 hours. Right. And, th and then I like the distributed model uh, for fulfillment. But I guess the question is, we, we live in the age of Amazon Prime. And uh, many customers expect to be able to place an order today and have it arrive tomorrow regardless. Mm -hmm. um, how do you set the expectation when you know it may, even if you have manufacturing very close to the customer, mm -hmm. it still may take a week? Uh, to, to you know, to get a product, how do you set that how, expectation? How do you circle that square? I, I mean, I think one of the big things that we talked about, and I think you heard in my presentation, I talk about that idea of sustainability, right? That idea that you're connecting with your customer, that this item is being custom created for you, right? We 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 talk about it a little bit like the um, uh, uh, the, the Chipotle, you know, sort of. Uh, uh, it's not fast food because it's still good food. It's still created for you, but it's a, you know, it's a level above, right? And so that idea that this product is for you, and we're seeing this more and more also within the, within the, within the uh, customer environment as well. I don't want something that everybody else has, right? Uh, Armando, when we first talked, I talked to you about, you know, 30 years ago, there were three network stations, right. and then there was basic cable, and now there's a thousand channels on cable and now there's a million channels on YouTube, right? So part of that is that idea that that item that you're purchasing, that connection, especially that's being made between merchant brand or content creator and their audience, that we, we really talk to our partners about feeding that in. Now, obviously, you know, you're absolutely right. We live in the age of Amazon. But as you look and talk to consumers, consumers are willing to accept four day average shipping right now with a production piece there you really do have to talk to consumers about you know why is this going to take a little bit longer but to wrap that message in we will not have any additional inventory we are not contributing to 10 percent of the world's carbon emissions we are uh you know we are producing this item in the united states for the united states or we are producing this item in france for france right there's very real reasons that a merchant can connect with their customer. We absolutely work with our partners to have that messaging. Why is it better for a consumer to get this one day later than if they were going to get, to get it from Amazon because the quality is better, because the service is better, because the connection is better, because that's a, that's a direct kind of connection. 
but you're absolutely right. There is a limit to the consumer's expectations there. Six day shipping and five days of production time plus a weekend. Now you're talking about ordering an item on a Monday and getting it three Mondays from now. Now you're now you're sort of stretching it. So again, this is one of those things that we've worked on incredibly hard. How can we take best in class opportunities and forward land that? We have 13 apparel manufacturers distributed around the United States right now. I want 26. There's eight shipping zones, but how can I have multiple manufacturing partners per shipping zone. So I'm increasing the capacity in each zone. So this is a never, I mean, look, Amazon has not stopped building more warehouses, right? Uh, right. So we are not going to stop in, in, in keeping up here, but it really does. I think there is a connection to the consumer in a, in a very similar way, as I said, around customer support, where a lost package can actually turn into a delighted consumer because you provide a differentiated level of service. It's very similar here. Why should the customer be happy to get an item in three days or four days or five days instead of next day? Well, because it's more sustainable, because it's more connected, because it is made for them. Do you think that message is a little bit more difficult if I'm using manufacturing on demand or print on demand for a portion of my sourcing as opposed for my entire product line? So if I'm, yeah. I'm also selling something that I'm shipping out of a warehouse that I have or a third party warehouse, how do I balance that? I think it's more nuanced, right? I mean, customer messaging and setting customer expectations is incredibly important, right? And we saw that in April, May, and June, right? It was helpful that everybody knew every package was getting delayed everywhere, right? right. But when we went back and looked at our customer sets that were proactively communicating to their customers that said, hey, there's an, you know, there's an under capacity shortage here. We have, uh, you know, people are out being safe and keeping themselves and their loved ones safe here. So this is gonna take a few more days you saw a completely different kind of engagement level than where you were reactive with what that was. You allowed the consumer to come in and ask. You didn't set those expectations, whether it was at the point of purchase, when that order confirmation email went through, when your shipping confirmation email went through, right? Uh, we, you know, we really respect partners in this industry. Narvar is a very interesting company whose entire business model is transparency. They literally just provide a plugin for transparency that allows you to feel as if I'm connected to a major brand because I'm seeing where my package is, right? All they're doing is taking information that exists from UPS and connecting it to, you know, the retailer to your door, right? And right. yet there's so much value there. And so that extension of how you connect with your customers and extending that all the way through the purchase lifecycle, again, can actually create a better engagement than if you simply said, Thanks for your order. You're going to get this eventually. You know, come back and buy from us again. Makes sense. I uh, and my camera just flipped off for a second. Flips back on here by itself. Sorry about that. Uh, one of the things I wanted to follow up on was I was uh, not aware of the fashion industry um, uh, data that you shared: thirty percent oversupply, uh, ten percent uh, of carbon emissions. Help me understand how manufacturing demand, print demand can alleviate some of that because as I think of it, you know, at the facilities in your network, there is still an already made t-shirt probably sitting, waiting to be printed. Is that not the case? Sure. There's a blank, there's a blank black shirt, but that black shirt can turn into anything or there's a white shirt or there's a red shirt or there's a fashion shirt. You're absolutely right. But again, it goes back to that idea of how unique is that item to the end customer, right? I, I use that extra small to extra large example all the time that you can sell 500 units, you can be perfectly, I produced 500 units, I sold 500 units, but now when I get to a SKU level, I sold 250 mediums, 250 larges, so I've lost 300 sales within the medium and large capacity, and I've got 300 units in the extra small, small, and extra large capacity that now don't fit, right? right. So that's a major, major element of it, no doubt. So just the very beginning of that matching capacity, matching demand, to what people are ordering, that's absolutely there. Um, I, I think the other big piece is that idea of if you're producing an item, for example, right? If you're producing an extra small decorated shirt in China, now that's shipping so much farther, 
for it ultimately not to be sold. So you go, you have to go all the way back into that chain of where that item was spun, literally almost to the to, to the uh, fabric factory, if you will, that starts this whole process. And so that underlying consumption allows itself to go back all the way in that process and save those sort of emissions, whether they're shipping emissions, storage emissions, double shipping emissions, create you know creative emissions, and then ultimately the amount of avoided landfill space. So I think that's another good question. A blank T-shirt never ends up in a landfill. A blank T-shirt just waits for an order. And so if that blank T-shirt never gets sold, another blank T-shirt never gets produced behind it. And that item never ends up in a landfill because it sits on a shelf waiting for an order where it's going to get decorated and delivered to the end customer. So it really does have this sort of knock on effect when you're trying to finalize that product as close to the purchase as possible. Makes sense. One of the other things, and this is all in a sense around the the context of uh, when you were talking about um, the speed and and uh, for me the the fact that you were moving things closer to the customer was part of the the carbon footprint savings. But the thing that came to my mind was a subscription model. So does it make sense, or would it make sense in your opinion, for a company that has a known customer base who's subscribing to a you know a box for Washington National fans and they have the license there? To, They're doing incredibly well, I assume. Yes, they, perfect. Yeah, Very right. small so, business idea. Yep. Uh, so for those folks, would it make sense to partner with a manufacturing demand partner? You know you've got 400 boxes going out to your subscribers or 4,000 boxes going out to your subscribers. Maybe you can even customize each one in some way. Does that, Is that a model that makes sense? Or for the description model, are they really okay. safer with the, sort of the old uh, no inventory? Doubt. I mean, this is that idea, Runner, that we've talked about, about the application of the manufacturing process to your business. So within those boxes, let's take a, let, let's take a, you, there's a core set of items and there's a selected set of items. Okay. So three items is going to go out to all 500 of our subscribers every single month. We're going to produce those in bulk. We're going to capture the unit economic savings. They're really not going to sit in inventory. I'm not going to have to handle them multiple times. I'm not going to have to pay multiple partners, but then there's the ability within your subscription box to personalize that box. I want a, mug, a coffee mug because I drink coffee, or I don't want a coffee mug because I don't drink coffee. I want a water bottle or I want a whatever. There is that opportunity to marry in a single ultimate package delivery, bulk capacity in which it goes everywhere, with on-demand capacity in which it's tailored to the end user, thus creating this concept of a fully personalized box, even if you have produced many of those items kind of in bulk, Hit those together and ultimately ship them to the end consumer. I'm going to use an example. I told you, Armando, I have a a problem with hats. I, I feel like it's not a problem. I feel like it's a uh, I feel like it's a, a low level addiction, maybe, but it's not really hurting me. Uh, but you may have noticed within the past three to five years that championship hats, right, are now gray or black or white, right? And they say, you know, World Series champion. And then Washington Nationals, who won in 2019, for anybody watching who forgot the Washington Nationals did win the last World Series in a full baseball season. I just want to make sure we all remember that. That's right in the middle. This is literally marrying individual production between mass production of the overall hat. The gray hat with World Series champions is shipped to the United States completely done with an opening for an on-demand embroidered logo the day they win the World Series. Right. And so this is how the industry is changing to actually complement bulk order manufacturing with on demand rather than creating those items and having them take two weeks from production to shipping. You can actually say World Series champions, Washington Nationals are here. Order your hats now. We will ship them to you in four days because those embroidery uh, 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 stations those screen press locations, those DTG on demand locations, right? Those are shipping out the, those are start, those get start getting made the day that literally actually the night, our, our facilities stay open 24 hours a day post championship. They start getting produced the second that is over. And if you want to think about another application of this, if you are a fan of the NFL, if you are a fan of MLB, player t shirts, right? So, uh, you know, uh, the national sign uh, a new player. I can have a t-shirt out to you the next day because I have my national blank ready to go. And then all I'm doing is printing on the back of the name. 
And so there's these, these hybrid applications within the technology that speak towards this idea of on-demand technology has now matched the retail expectation that previously bulk capacity could only match. And so now the end customer really cannot tell that difference with enterprise grade quality applications with, with the right machinery, with the right processes between something that was held in inventory and something that was created on demand. Makes sense. The, uh, this gets me thinking about sort of the, the limitations, if you will, or, or maybe they're not of um, manufacturing demand. I recently had a conversation with a, a company that was using, um, uh, basically they were printing, they were printing uh, plastic covers for your outlets on your walls and supplying locally um, you know, some, uh, some hardware stores. And the idea would be the hardware store, instead of keeping you know, 50 white uh, little covers on the wall, they'd keep three. And when one sells, they order another one and mm -hmm. it shows up. You know? And so the economics of that weren't there yet. But in your opinion, like, is this really relegated to wall hangings, t-shirts, and coffee mugs? Or what's the future of manufacturer on demand? No, no the, the future of manufacturer on demand is, as I said from the beginning, in the middle of my presentation, I talked about the idea as we define manufacturing on demand for this presentation, minimum order quantity of one, 72 hour lead time, right? Right. But as you start to expand that out, you alluded to it, right? I've got a blank t-shirt that's sitting there in the factory that has to be there, right? So that's been produced in advance. It's taking that same concept and lowering it. How can you lower? So instead of having to produce 500 outlet sockets, now I can uh, uh, profitably produce them as five, right? Now, the for things like plastics and, and things like that, 3D printing is going to be a revolution here, right? But that same concept of instead of ordering 1,000, 5,000, 10,000 units, if I look at my all-in costs, does it make more sense to order a run of 50 and then set my safety stock or my reorder uh, uh, point at 15. Well, let's look into it. How long does it take to produce? Sorry, it takes a week. What's my historical sales data, right? And then how long does it take to ship? So I'm going to be in flight with orders. This is a, a sea change that some industries have seen, right? If you think about Dell, sell the computer, you know, build the computer, sell the computer. Dell said, sell the computer, then build the computer. Right. And what they did was they just put each component in factories next to each other, right? So that it could just move directly. Um, it's that same kind of underlying concept of how do you create that opportunity and understand lead time. What's incredibly important is historical sales data. One of the things you're going to start seeing from platforms like Guten is the ability you, you are never, your data is always yours. Your data is absolutely walled off, right? But if you start to use that data and anonymize that data and aggregate that data, when you look at types of customer base, when you look at traffic, for example, when you look at historical conversion rate, and then you start layering things in, okay, I'm going to connect my Google ads platform. And when I put $10,000 into Google ads, my, my sales spike, hopefully, if you're doing Google ads right, right? Right. You can actually start to then say, all right, this is going to modify how quickly these items are going to sell out. And so there is a data play that comes in to the manufacturing process where that same application of Three-day production, minimum order quantity of one can be extended to seven-day production, minimum order quantity of 20 with a three-day shipping lead time. It's the same underlying math when it's connected to historical sales data. So you're going to start seeing this more and more and more. You're seeing this with big companies. Nike made a massive acquisition about a year ago, which was entirely focused on inventory optimization after they took a billion-dollar inventory write down. Right. So a lot of this really is going to be shorter run more direct to consumer, more personalized, all of that thematically is ultimately gonna fit into manufacturing on demand. And ultimately, Armando, it's just gonna be manufacturing, right? This idea of manufacturing on demand or manufacturing some other way is just gonna go away. And it's just gonna be what's the right way to produce an item for the specific sale, for the specific application, for the specific business. You used an analogy towards the end of your presentation of cloud computing, um, essentially, to this process. Um, one of the things I just want to ask just for, for clarity's sake, though, is as, as more manufacturing facilities come online with your network, with other similar networks as they develop, and I am a retailer using it like a cloud computing base, does that not suddenly mean that all of those manufacturers are only competing on price? And how does this 
impact your manufacturing base. Are they competing on price right now though? Right? They're competing on they quality. Be. They're competing on service, right? We talk all the time that there's even within the industrial grade or enterprise grade uh, equipment market, there are in each one of our markets at least three manufacturing uh, uh, OEM hardware equipment manufacturers that can match that kind of retail quality, right? Okay. And where some machines can be $30,000 to $50,000 with a slightly lower output versus a $600,000 machine, the most important item is can you keep that machine up, right? So there's a quality and service level there that absolutely matter. As another example, I use uh, 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 wall art. Wall okay. art, I, I use the apparel example to kind of show, you know, what a, 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 a home printer that takes two minutes versus an industrial printer that takes 20 seconds, right? Wall art though has the widest range because you're talking about what's, what's it framed with? Is that cardboard? Is that foam? Is that high quality wood? What's the quality of the print? The consumer was conditioned to, a, to accept a lower quality print when the photo industry moved from silver halide technology to basically dot matrix or, or inkjet printing, right? When you could mm -hmm. go to CVS and they could just spin it out of a printer, you got a lower quality print, but it happened faster. And dirty secret of the photo industry, silver halide technology is horrendously bad for the economy, right? And so what happened was the consumer was conditioned to expect this lower quality physical output. And then what happened is those machines just got a lot better. And so now you've got the ability to match that quality, that one-off quality with the best in, you know, with the best in class kind of lowest production costs. There's still gonna be that application of, again, understanding your business is the value in the content and is that value in the, I'm gonna give you the cheapest possible opportunity. There's a very real place in the market for cardboard or for, or for foam versus sure. wood. That really just sort of matters there. Manufacturers are no different though, Armando, than merchants. They need to run machines, they need to run people, and they need to run space, right? Can you put an item in? Can it get produced? And shockingly, can you put it in the right shipping container? Right. If Armando's T-shirt says go, you know, go, uh, go Mets and Brian's T-shirt says go Nationals, please don't put those T-shirts in the in the opposing uh, package because right. you're going to have two dissatisfied customers there. So there's absolutely a very real kind of value to that. But but my argument is that's no different than traditional manufacturing uh, capabilities. Armando, right. But what's the difference between screen printer A and screen printer B? It's service level, it's quality of the underlying item, it's ability to, to meet or exceed customer expectations, it's ability to scale, right? So, so yes, to a certain extent, it will you will have winners and losers, but mm -hmm. the industry is changing so fast and there's so many different applications here, you're going to see a lot of different applications that make sense for each different kind of measure of the industry. You, you say measure of the industry, and it kind of brings me back to one other question I had. You had a slide where you were talking about sort of measuring, if you will, the your your manufacturer on demand, print demand partner. Um, could you talk just briefly a little bit in detail about each of those KPIs? What should I, if I'm a retailer, look for? Um, and how should I measure those KPIs? If you want to pop that back up on the screen, you're welcome to do that too. Yeah, I'll uh, do that. Uh, let me just share this right here. So, uh, you know, look, the, the thing you want to look for broadly Right. If you can see this now, yep. one of them, one of them is an output of the 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 uh, literally the facility map or the footprint. Right. Shipping days has as much to do with the distribution of orders as it does with the underlying capability. Right. OK. Um, so and you can buy your way out of that. I can I can send something expedited. Right. And cut that shipping days in half. Can you get two day shipping at a standard shipping rate? For four zones, you can. The problem is for zone five, six, seven, and eight, you, you, you can't. So this is one of the items. The biggest question that you want to ask here is, what daily pickups do you have at a facility or at the factory, right? So if USPS comes every day, but UPS only comes every other day, then even if you upgrade to UPS next day air, if they're not picking up the next day, you now effectively are paying for next day air, but you're shipping it out in two days, right? right. So that the practical application there is what shipping agents do you have access to and do they come every single day? Order shipped on time is absolutely there, right? If you think about that same idea of 1% of orders are lost, 
there are QA steps all the way through the process. When an, or, when, a, when an item comes off of the production line before it it's, it puts in the package, right? So it's now produced, but it's not yet in the package. Due to the on-demand nature, there's going to be variation there, right? Whether that's the inks were off, whether it was off-centered, for whatever reason that it happens, you're going to have a 1% to 2% sort of QA situation that's caught ahead of it getting into the package. Again, produce on demand, that starts over. That starts the process over. So there is going to be some variation in that underlying production time. We quote a two to three business day order SLA when our order items are going out at times within 24 to 48 hours, right? So in normal non-peak time, you're talking one day to two days, but we really flex up three or four when you get into Christmas or you're selling Valentine's Day items. There's, there's, there's sort of a nature of that. Look and talk about what that average production days is, but also really think about what is that on-time SLA and how often do you get there? Our goal here to be clear is 97 to 98%. We have work, we have work to do on every one of these statistics, right? Mm -hmm. That's that is our goal. We have to set a minimum and then we are looking to improve on that. This production error rate. We are looking to get that under 1%. The industry average here, to be clear, when you when you talk to people in the industry, it's 2.5%. Now, that rounds up a little bit. That includes things like lost in transit. That includes a few different things. How can we lower that? But remember, 1.7 production error rate means 1.7 of your customers will have 100% of their items that are misshipped, that are misprinted. Do you have the ability when that naturally happens to take that on, right? The trade-off there is no inventory. The trade, you know, there, there is a cost benefit here. So that's, we focus on time, we focus on quality, and we focus on, sp on speed, which is, which is slightly different from time. That's really our focus. And I think broadly, as the industry itself continues to kind of increase in quality, you're going to see that much more and more, right? You're not going to look as much at the, what's the underlying quality of the print? You're going to look at how fast that gets out. Our ability to share those stats, Armando, just to really nail this point, is because we have already vetted quality. We've already vetted capacity. We've already vetted, you know, I mean, amount of blanks on the floor so that if we have a surge in orders, you can keep up with that. Um, you know, those are sort of, we take those almost as table stakes. Those are other things you really do have to, to ask yourself. And, and as I think about partnering versus using a, a, a partner solution, you know, going direct versus using a partner solution, have you walked the floor of every manufacturing facility that you're going to utilize with your brand? I have. I've walked at the floor of every single one of our facilities. There are other manufacturing partners that you can go out with that absolutely have that control. If you don't, really considering, really consider partnering here because the value of what you're creating is the content and that connection with your audience. You know, that makes good sense. And I really like what you just said there because I would bet you that most uh, purchasing agents at retail companies have not walked the floor of every manufacturing facility that uh, they buy from or that produces the products they sell. We are getting very close to the end of the hour. Um, I do want to circle back to something you said earlier. So when we first talked uh, for the interview that became an article on Parts of Commerce, I was uh, skeptical of this. And you have, you have encouraged me about this. The thing that I think uh, still has to happen, you tell me if I'm wrong, though, as this continues to scale, just like everything has so far, yeah. it's going to get better and better and more financially viable across the board. You've had fantastic growth rates so far. Talk to me about the industry, though. Like, what's the growth rate overall, or, or where do you think we're headed with this in the next couple of years? We talk about it all the time. You know, Armando, in our first conversation, I told you this. It, it seems like the world is waking up to this growth, and I'm telling people it's been here for five years. It's just right. we've, we've been this sort of club that's known about it. The quote that I use all the time is this, uh, manufacturer on demand as, a, as sort of a subset from an industry standpoint is growing at 2x the e-commerce e e industry growth. And the e-commerce industry growth is growing at 2x economic growth. So there's this sort of 4x increase. And, and that's, that is a, a combination of two different things. That's new and novel applications of the capability, right? I could not uh, economically produce a customized item 10 years ago that was of a quality that matched my brand. That's one part of it. And the other part of it is this idea that within just within the apparel industry, 
or the broader fashion industry, right now around 5% of units are produced digitally. As we look at it, that should be 35%. If you were to optimize that production, that idea of on-demand manufacturing will ultimately just become part of manufacturing, that's 35%. So there's 7X growth today without the continued growth, without this shift of what should be being produced on demand. So this industry is growing as fast as those of us in the industry can keep up with it. And if it's April of 2020, faster than us in the industry <laughs> can keep up with it. Um, and so it really is going, you know, where the industry ultimately goes. And I think the most interesting things that you're going to see within the industry or for those of us in the industry is this concept of it, the either or gets completely wiped out, right? It is just manufacturing and it's it's incumbent on the industry. It's incumbent on partners like Guten who have the software layer that allow the manuf the merchant partner, the e-commerce brand, the seller, right? They and, and, and ultimately the end customer not to have to worry about how it's produced. You already don't worry if I ship it USPS or UPS or FedEx, that shouldn't matter to you, right? right. And so from that standpoint, where the industry goes is to say, you need an item produced. Well, if you need 500 of them, okay, we'll bulk produce them. If you need one of them, we'll, we'll do it on demand. If you need you know, 50, maybe there's gonna be a hybrid technology. If you need the kit items, okay, maybe it's gonna hit a fulfillment center, but it's never actually gonna sit in inventory. Maybe there's an opportunity where you launch a new product and on day one, you get 500 orders. Well, using your historical data, we know that 500 orders in day one typically means 2,000 orders going down the line. So instead of producing 500, we're going to produce 1,500. And we're going to forward land those so that you get that next day shipping. You get that Amazon style experience. And then if it keeps going, I can lean back on on-demand production and run the long tail, right? It's matching production cycles to the commerce cycle. That is what's happening over the next five years. And that's where you're gonna see so many more applications as we talked about with the, the, the plastic electrical covers, right? Of how you take the concept of on-demand manufacturing and marriage to data and marriage to capabilities and you really apply it as close to the point of purchase as possible. That makes fantastic sense. Brian, I very much appreciate you taking time for, to join us in the Commerce Code community. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Armando. Really appreciate it. All right. See everybody back in the community. Please uh, go into the uh, the community topic or into the e-commerce operations topic. If you are using manufacturing demand, printed demand for your business, I'd like to know how you're using it. If you've worked with Brian's company, tell us what you thought of him uh, as a customer. I'd like to know in the community. Thanks very much. Everybody have a great day. Thanks so much.